So you've got someone here who's got experience in sort of the nuts and bolts of doing that. Uh, Luke Davis serves as the Compton Gardens site manager. Uh, Compton Gardens is uh, one of two historic landmarks which is the Compton Foundation preserves. Uh, for the last four years, Luke has helped maintain uh, the seven acres native plant and public garden along with facilities on the property. Uh, previously, to, uh, previous to joining the foundation, uh, he spent over 10 years working with various professional baseball organizations and universities with sports turf management. So he's got uh, lots of good practical experience. Uh, besides uh, Compton Gardens, he managed the grounds at Bentonville Historical Society. Uh, and he really, uh, one thing he mentioned that he really enjoys about his job is working with volunteers, which we are a volunteer organization. So, if you join me, welcome to Luke Davis.
Alright, next slide, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're broken down into several sections. So we have the house in Bear area. Um, we transfer there from like the native US and some of the Dr. Compton plants. But some of the plants that he grew were not natives, but we kept them around because he, he planted them. I mean, it's very important. Like, he had a whole azalea collection that we gathered from out the properties and put them in front of the house. Um, as we move away from there, we get into all Arkansas natives. We move into the meadow. Um, so we have our section of our meadow, and that moves into the savanna. The savanna is um, where the woods or forest meets a meadow. So that's the savanna. Um, so the idea of Compton, it breaks down to small um, microenvironments, biospheres of what you would find in nature. So hopefully if you come out and you see our bluff blade, and then you go out in nature, or go hiking and see a bluff blade, you're going to see the same plants. So this is an easy way for you guys to come out and identify, see plants and identify them, and then find them out in nature. Um, then we head down the hill, we transfer into the woodlands, and then woodlands into Cindy Springs. We actually have our own spring. Um, and then we have a couple special, then we have a bird sanctuary, and then a couple specialty areas with the orchid area, a trillium area, and a rain garden area. Yes? Do you have a resident bear? <laughs> we do have a resident group of bears. Um, we have a statue, the group of bears. Um, <laughs> oh, let's see. You got me on that one. A turtle and a hare. <coughs> What's that? A turtle and a hare. No, that's not us. Oh, that's like we start, the art trail starts with us on the uh, group of bears by okay. Paul Manship. Same, if you guys have ever been to New York City, the same group of bears are in Central Park. Um, Paul Manship, his famous, most famous, he's supposed to be considered one of the most famous sculptors because his Prometheus in Rockefeller <coughs> Center. The guy that was that's him as well. Um, but yeah, that's uh, we have a group of bears. That's that's that actually belongs to Crystal Bridges, but it's on our property. Okay. Reasons why you use native plants. Well what is a native plant? It's a plant that's indigenous to the region. So naturally, if it naturally grows here, if it was growing here before we were here, it should be pretty easy to grow in your landscape. Hopefully. Next slide. Uh, low maintenance, if planted in the right place, do your research. It's the information age. It's, so, and I do this myself because I experiment with plants in my own house. I'll, it says sun and bark shade, but you kind of budget it a little bit, maybe this tree gets more shade. But if you do the research and you find the right spot for your plants, um, it's very low maintenance. Um, those plants right there are uh, Jacob's Ladder and then some Dwarf Crested Iris. Um, that was not the right place for those Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder requires a lot of moisture. And that was <coughs> firm with very poor irrigation. Okay, next one. Drought tolerant. They are usually very drought tolerant once they are established. This is one thing people kind of don't understand is, oh, it's a native plant, I just plant it, it's okay. No, this root still, it's still plant, it has to be established, so get the roots going, and then once it gets going, it should be good to go. Um, because it naturally grows here. Um, you got a uh, prickly pear right there. That's pretty drought tolerant. Um, that's part of a bluff blade right there. And it's native. It is. It's the only native cactus to Arkansas. Uh -huh. I still don't like it. Uh -huh. <laughs> the prickly pear, I don't know. Everybody mess with it, but it actually has yeah. very small spines, but they have hooks in them. Yeah. So they're it's horrible. The small spines, once they get hooked in, it's like a fish hook. It's horrible. Yeah, it's like duct tape. I went through a roll one day. Uh, soil. They help improve the soil, prevent soil erosion. 
Um, this is kind of a simple fix I did on this picture on the right. The top part of that, that's just uh, pale violet. The pale mm -hmm. violet is a real fibrous root system. Um, if you can see how steep, I mean, that's probably a 70 grade slope right there. And I just put all those pale violets in there and they held the, the soil bank. You know, if you could turn off most of the lights in the back, we, oh, yeah. pictures would show up so much better. Can you turn the lights back off? Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I, I, Somebody. Here to yell at people. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. Alright, okay, next slide. And wildlife. We're going to touch on this a little bit later, but um, this is a kind of main reason. Um, of course, we got a monarch and a zebra swallowtail, uh, the spice bush caterpillar, a little bumblebee there. Go ahead, next one. And setting. This is a lot of people's problems with uh, native plants. Everybody thinks they're wild. Yes, some of them are wild, some will spread, but do research and figure out which ones are good for that and which ones aren't. It can be used in a formal setting. Layers and groupings, and it really comes together very nicely. Fourth, if you have the room, you can do it informal. You can just throw together a uh, butterfly garden. If you got, you know, 12, 15 square feet, you can really put together something nice that's informal. All right. Sorry. All right, so on the property, we have some gigantic white oaks. Um, probably my favorite large tree out there. Um, great fall color. You can kind of identify the white oak kind of hard to see in this picture. The white oak has, um, if you look at the top, especially going up towards the top of it, has a flaky kind of bark to it. Um, this is the, oh, what is it? It's 150 species of, or no, over 500 species. It, let me get my back straight here. If left undisturbed, it can get up to 150 feet tall. And there's over 500 beneficial this is beneficial to over 500 species of insects. So, if you're really concerned about insects and wildlife, this is a great tree to plant. I think I got this one. Okay, it's orange. Everybody knows this one, right? Hedge apple. Um, we have a very large one on property. Um, it has this really orange, nice orange color. Um, it's also known as a boat arc. Um, the French um, use, and the French and the um, Native Americans also use this. The uh, wood on it's really re resilient. They can bend it and bend it back. So this is what they used to make their long boats out of. Um, another fun fact they call it the hedge apple because you'll find rows of them when the, um, the cattlemen start heading west. They wouldn't let the landowners put up barbed wire fences. So the landowners, and then the landowners didn't want cattle going through and destroying the land. So they would plant rows of this, because this has a thorn on it about an inch and a half long. Um, actually had to cut some small ones of the day. It was very, very difficult. Um, next slide. One thing about that, squirrels like these don't see. They do, they love them. It's funny to watch little squirrels pushing down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> we have plenty of squirrels in the All right. Northern catalpa. Uh, another one of my favorite trees. Again, a really resilient tree. As, as if it loses some limbs, it's definitely resilient to grow them back. And it always has these great big tropical looking leaves on them and then white and purple flowers. And if you don't know this one, you've probably never seen these um, cigar-shaped bean pods. They're about that long, they're indestructible. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you ever done some actual landscape work and had to deal with one of those, it's, it'll take you a while to get those ones cleaned up. Um, and they don't mow very well. But it's a fantastic tree. Um, the catalpa worm, great fishing. It looks like there are two different kinds of leaves there. 
Yeah, that top right one? Uh-huh. Yeah, I was noticing that. Uh, that might be uh, different than top of it. That's a chestnut. Is that a chestnut? Or a... That's not a buckeye. I'll revisit that one and change it, though. Sorry about that. And one of our state champions is the Yellowwood. Um, Yellowwood is a biannual bloomer. It's absolutely magical once it does bloom. That panicle of flowers in the middle is about a foot to two feet long. And if you can see on the right, it just covers the tree. Um, we've actually had a few weddings try to climb out underneath the tree at Compton. Uh, state champion means the biggest type of that tree in the state. Is this the year for it to bloom? Excuse me? Is this the year for it to bloom? Last year was the year for it to bloom, and then we had a late freeze. Oh, yeah. So I'm really curious what happens now, because I don't know if it's going to bloom this year or not. So it should be pretty interesting. Um, blooms in April, uh, early May. Um, blooms stay out for a little while. <coughs> it's also um, part of the pea family, so it's a lagoon. Um, so it's also a nitrogen mixer. And it gets great fall yellow color. Is that next slide? Large tree or not so large? It's a large tree. Um, it's about 50, 75 feet. Uh, everybody should know this one living in Northwest Arkansas. Easter Red Bud is still one of my favorites. Um, it does, if you do have this at home, um, again, another resilient tree where if a couple of limbs fall off, it will definitely grow back. And you can play around with these a lot. I'm actually in my backyard, I've been trimming some off to kind of round it out. And uh, keeps growing back and looking really beautiful. Um, but this, they are known to have a weaker branch, branching structure, so you do need to keep up with the pruning on these. If, or you can just let it go. Um, they're pretty either way. I got one that's at the garden, it's literally the top fell off of it. It's about 20 feet tall, and it's hanging, and it's still blooming and still growing. Mine doesn't flower. Is there a male and female? No, it's probably not mature enough. How big is it? It's big. It's big? It's big. That's what made me wonder if it's... Huh. It's in the front yard. It's kind of a shady spot, but I thought it was getting enough time. Maybe it takes some sun. That's weird. So there's... You sure it's a dog or a shirt's a red bud? Well, 90% sure. That's one of those things, like, when I worked in the grass, everybody's like, I got this brown spot in my yard, and it's like... I don't really know what type of grass you have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to tell. Um, yeah, just uh, check out the leaves and stuff on it. Well, it looks like, like uh, leaf wise. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Um, Pop Pop. Is anybody here? Pop Pop? Anyone? Pop Everybody loves Pop Pop. Right. Uh, the reason why they call it Pop Pop is that fruit. It's a real nice custard fruit. The reason why they call it a pawpaw, you cut it in half, you open it up, it looks like a bear paw. Mm -hmm. uh, is anybody eating a pawpaw? Mm -hmm. right. <coughs> well, if you have a chance to get it, to try it, it's, it's a very interesting. It's kind of a sweet custard, it's kind of mango, mm -hmm. I, kind of, almost kind of tart but with honey. Those are mango. Yeah. Um, understory tree. <coughs> uh, grow, they grow in a grove. Um, here's the flowers on the top left. The flowers are actually hanging down. And the flower stinks. Not like I can smell it from no. over there, but it, if you get up close to it, it's not even smell it kind of stinks. Um, it's, it's pollinated by um, flies. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. It's a little. These little fruits are pollinated by flies. It hangs upside down, so, so the flies are the only ones one, one, one can get into it. And it doesn't smell good, so. Alright, next slide. Smoke tree, American smoke tree. Another, uh, this is a sunny to part sun tree. This one here is a part sun. Absolutely great fall color. I mean, I thought this picture was good, and it doesn't even capture how beautiful this tree is in the fall. You're looking at three or four different colors there. Um, it's about 15, 20 feet tall. In the spring, it gets these uh, real flowing uh, purplish-white panicles on it. Um, kind of the reason why it's called smoke tree. 
Other reason is because um, the story is told. Native American children, you should see the adults smoking. So the smoke tree has a little hollow sticks on it. So they would snap it off and use those and pretend they were smoking. Spice bush, uh, very underrated. Um, this needs to be planted in more landscapes, in my opinion. It's, it's easily controlled, has a great smell to it. Um, it doesn't get very big. It probably gets about six feet tall, maybe five feet around. It's beautiful, uh, shiny brown or shiny uh, green leaves on it. It gets those nice bright red berries on it. The birds absolutely love. Um, Spice bush caterpillar. Does it grow in the shade? It does. There are some nice ones at the end of the business. This is one of those ones that probably should replace some other ones. And this, go ahead on the next one. And I put these couple in here. This is another one that needs to replace a lot of, of non-native landscape plants. This is a black hole by Burnham. Um, it can be trimmed up to a small tree or it can be used as a shrub or a hedge. Um, when you see the term hall, that is an old English word for hedge. So great multi-seasonal interest. You can see the white flower on there. It's about three or four inches around. And then in the fall, great fall color. And the, the berries on it get this real kind of purplish, um, dark blue color to it. Um, only just about 10, 15 feet tall. So. <coughs> American beauty berry. Would that be shade under under Story. under trees under story? It can be both shade and sun. It will flower more in the sun. That's kind of a rule of thumb. If it does flower, it will flower more in the sun. Uh, American beauty berry. Again, can be planted in the sun or shade. Uh, we'll get bigger in the sun. We'll get more berries and more flowers on it. But it can be planted in the shade and just stays a little bit smaller. <coughs> um, we have some that uh, grow anywhere from five or six feet. We have some that are two or three feet. Um, get these great clusters of berries on them. They actually have a really nice citrus smell to them. And, uh, the birds kind of stay away from them until the end of the year, and then they come in through and eat them once they start decaying. <coughs> Go ahead, next. Next cat. Do you like coming birds? This is the plant you need to plant. This is a late season blooming August ish uh, bloomer. So it's always kind of hard to find those late season bloomers. Um, and it gets this, this picture on the top left there. It has this little, uh, I hate to say church cap, but that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> and then, then it gets to develop these uh, nice red berries in the middle there. Um, and it is a perennial. Go ahead, next one. Full shape plant. Small shrub, is that what it is? Uh, it's a perennial. It gets uh, it will spread out and get pretty a decent size. But um, I wouldn't call it a shrub. No. Yeah. It's not woody, is it? No. Not woody. No, and it's a perennial. It gets cut every year. Full shrub. No, full shape. That's what's great about it. All right, now this next couple slides are going to be my starter. If you don't have any native plants, these are the easiest ones for me to tell you to grow. Um, this is a Missouri primrose. Gets uh, these flowers on it are about four or five inches around. So they're really beautiful. When they come out, they're gorgeous. Um, and it forms in a clump, about two, three feet around, maybe a foot high. Full sun. So you can either plant them as just regular clumps, where you can try to make a ground cover out of them. Um, here we're, we're establishing a ground cover in the front here. And when, how long would they bloom? Uh, about three or four months. Oh. Yeah, okay. full sun, summertime, great plant. Japanese people love them. Uh -oh. <laughs> really? We don't have a problem with Japanese people. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to want it. Purple color flower. Yeah. Another great starter plant. Everyone probably knows this one already. 
Um, there's been some argument about true natives and native bars. So where you see echinacea, purpurea, sunburst, or whatever. Um, the argument that I've heard, and I'm not sure, I haven't done the studies and I haven't read very much on it, is that the true natives will are better for the wildlife. That they will re get more butterflies, more insects use them than the native bars. Um, so I'm choosing to believe that since I'm all native, but we don't have, we have, I think, maybe three native bars on property. The rest of them are true natives. Um, but purple cone cloud is a great one. You can see the uh, zebra swallowtail that's the right. Uh, gets about three, four feet high, blooms for a couple months, full sun. Full sun of park shade. Definitely needs three or four hours of direct sunlight, though. Okay, this one. Fox glove beard tone. Mm -hmm. Alright, fox love is because it looks like fox love's beard tongue is because it looks like it has a tongue with a beard on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, semi evergreen, um, so it'll form a little clumps and that will stay, um, they'll actually get a nice kind of kind of maroon purple uh, leaf color to it, but then it comes back in the spring and shoots up these uh, these flowers, about three or four feet tall. Very, very hardy plant. Um, full sun, part shade again. This is the one that's kind of hard to kill. Once you're out there, it's the mountain up. Um, it does form clumps. Oh it does form clumps, so it doesn't, it's not going to spread like crazy. But if you do, you can come in and divide the clumps and just keep spreading it yourself. Alright, next. Garden plots, perennial flocks. Um, another full sun perennial, great starter plant. Um, I use this a lot for fences. I've done this at my house. When I, so when I first came here in Arkansas, I worked for university, I didn't know anything about native plants. I planted a calorie pear and some burning bush. Um, so in the native plant world, I should probably be shot. <laughs> But, so I've gone through and I've integrated. I didn't take those out. There was a, it was actually the Cleveland, so it's the Cleveland parrot, so it's not spreading, making things worse. Um, but I've actually integrated in, and I know I have a northern top in my backyard. Yes, I'm dealing with seed pods. Uh, red buds, and then I have a small fence, and I use this as a backdrop, this and the fox club. And it's absolutely gorgeous, the entire fence one. And I'll come in in front of it, and put irises or whatever I want to. Um, but these, all these plants get about three or four feet tall, so <laughs> it, it provides. And now my vegetable garden, I have more bees in my backyard than I ever did before. Um, so, perennial flocks. I'm going to get off my stuff off tonight. Uh, full sun, it's about three or four feet tall. <coughs> um, shoots up individual stalks with flowers on the end. That picture in the middle, this is one of the things that when you learn about native plants and then you see them out in the wild, that is in the middle of uh, Norfolk River. I'm a fly fisher and I'm sitting there and I turn around and there's this, this old dead stump in the middle of the river and this clock's growing on it. So I was like, oh, oh, I'm not catching anything, at least that's cool. <laughs> uh, American Columbine, small. Um, uh, part shade, full shade plant. Um, if it, the more sun it gets, the more it will spread. Um, the more it's in the shade, the less it will spread. 